Come on, I am, uh, I am so grateful that you're here today. Because, you know, you're not just ending 2019 in church. You're ending a decade in church as we go into the new year. I believe how you end one season really matters for how you enter into your next one. And so we're heading into 2020 uh, with passion and excitement. But we're so excited you're here if you are with us for the first time. I'm not the only one who's excited. My name is Pastor Nick Newman. I just want to say welcome. But the whole church is glad you're here. Church, can you help me welcome everybody here for the first time? We are pumped. Pumped. Excited for what we're going to be doing today. This is a, a team teaching weekend for us here at Propel Church. And if you're not familiar with what that looks like, it's where we have more than one communicator teach on a weekend. In fact, all these five communicators behind me will all have six minutes apiece to teach. And the whole reason why we do this is, is really because um, my heart is not that this church would be built around my gifts or my personality, but that we would be consistently raising up and training people to tell other people about Jesus. Because we think we could do a lot of good work in a town if, if we just have one person who knows how to tell people about Jesus. But if we can teach everybody how to tell people about Jesus, then we're going to impact the nation. And that's the goal. Because I, I told our team this last week, and, and I don't, I'm going to eat up your time, or your time and your time and your time. I'm going to eat up. But uh, our heart is to plant a life-giving church in every small town in America. Because you know there's more small towns than there are big cities. Right. And I teach church planting to, to people. I, I coach for church planting networks. And I'm just going to tell you, nobody's chomping at the bit to plant a church in a 2,000-person town. They're just not doing it. But we believe that's what God's called us to. And we're going to raise up communicators to do that. So here's what I need your help with today. Number one, these communicators are, are some, some of them are more experienced than others. Regardless, I need you to amen and celebrate them louder than you've ever done it before. Right? So when they make a good point, you say amen. When they tell a joke that's not funny, you laugh anyways. <laughs> Because we want to encourage them in their faith. And the second thing, they're going to have a six-minute timer on the screen except for the last person. And when they get down to 10 seconds, I need you to help me count them down. 10, 9, we're going to see if y'all know how to do numbers today. But <laughs> we're excited. So church, without further ado, would you help me welcome and honor the first communicator for this morning, Will Cochran. Good morning. How's everybody doing? So my message is applicable to everybody, but I want to focus particularly on men this morning. And I have a feeling somebody needs to hear it because the enemy straight up tried to take me out with a paint pole to keep me away. Didn't work. All right. So let's talk. Being in today's society, in today's culture, it's, it's difficult being a man because we're, everywhere that we go and everything that we do, we're asked to be a certain way in a specific thing. And let's be honest, a lot of times... It's in contradiction to the way that God has designed us. Well, let's look at work. Work expects us to be a yes man. Society, well, they want a nice guy. TV portrays us as being, you know, childish with families who constantly disrespect us. And church, well, they want quiet and perfect. I've noticed that men, by and large, in a lot of churches are being overlooked. So I have two points for you today. First point, it's not, it, it is, it's okay to not be okay. And I cannot stress this enough. It is okay to not be okay. The enemy is going to tell us lies, and we have all heard them, and it goes something like this. Suck it up. You're okay. You got this. You're fine. I'm fine. I got this. Well, guess what? You're not fine. You don't got this. There is only one place you can be fine. Jeremiah 13, 17 says, But I will bring you health and will heal you of your wounds. This is the Lord's declaration. They will call you outcast, Zion, whom no one cares about. Jesus is where you find healing and you get spiritual health. See, these wounds that we carry as men, these are internal wounds. These are wounds from our father, a spouse, a family member. These are wounds from rejection. These are wounds from, from being betrayed. And let me tell you guys, it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel the pain. 
You're told it's not, but it is. And men, we process our feelings just a little differently than other people do. We close off. We bury it in work. A lot of times it turns to anger, and that's good for no one. Um, John Eldridge wrote in Wild of Heart that first you have to surrender your hurt, and then you have to grieve it. So what does that look like? To surrender your hurt means you have to acknowledge it. You have to give it space. You have to say, well, mm, man, when that happened, that hurt. You, you have to say that. When, when they said that about me, oh, that stung. That hurt. It had an effect on me. It wasn't a positive effect. And what it looks like to grieve a wound is, is you have to figure out what that is. I mean, you have, like, am I angry? Am I mad? Am I hurt? Do I feel betrayed? So what is going on right now? You have to look at that. You have to confront that feeling, and you have to acknowledge it. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, grieving this is a lot like grieving anything else. I mean, there's, there's going to be tears. And that's okay. I didn't say this in the first service, but the second, you guys get this as a freebie. There is so much strength in a tear-soaked beard. Right? Second point I have for you today. You need a safe place to bleed out. A lot of you don't have that. So I would be willing to bet most of you here don't have a place to go to. And I would be willing to bet that there's not very many people here that have someone who speaks into your life about your spiritual health. And a place that you can bleed out to is somebody that's going to pick you up. I mean, does this sound familiar? Oh, come on, sissy. That didn't hurt. Is that all you got? Stop whining. I mean, that's common, that's common talk at a man's job site. I mean, it is. And every man in here, I would be willing to bet anything has heard that. And a lot of you have said the same thing to some other man. You may have been saying it jokingly, but you don't know what he's gone through. You don't know what he's been through. You don't know what he's going through right now. You don't know what he's going home to. This could be the one remark that pushes him over the edge. A safe place is someone that can speak life into you, help you up, and dust you off. Proverbs 16, 24 says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the taste and health to the body. Words of life are healing. Freedom teaches us that. Words of life that we, and death that we speak over people and over ourselves. Yeah, that's a thing. Does this sound familiar? Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm stupid. I hate myself. All lies that the enemy is telling you to believe. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks rashly like a pure sword. The tongue of the wise brings healing. You need to be a, a place to bleed out. You need a place to bleed out. And you need, a place where some, you need to be a place where somebody else can bleed out too. Lastly, Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine. A broken spirit dries up the bones. If you're not healthy... You can't be there for somebody else that needs you. That's it. Well, good morning, guys. My name is Kenya, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving here at Propel Church as our guest experience coordinator. And for the next few minutes, I just kind of wanted to share with you guys how our faith is often tested and the impact that it can have not only in our own lives, but in the people around us. I'm going to be in Daniel chapter 3. Um, I'm going to pick up in verse 14, but before I do so, I'm just going to kind of recap what's happened prior to this. In verse number 1, we see a king. His name's King Nebuchadnezzar. And what King Nebuchadnezzar has done is he's placed this statue or this gold image in the center of a town, and he's demanding that everybody in this town bow down to this image that he's created. And ultimately, what he's wanting is he's wanting everyone to bow down to who he is and what he's done for the, the city. And he's threatening to throw anybody into this furnace that refuses to bow down. And I think in our own lives, we have something similar to that. People in the world often want us to bow down to what they think is right and what they think is the good thing to do. And often making us think that our way of thinking is better than God's way of thinking. In this story, there's three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refuse to bow down to this image that King Nebuchadnezzar has created.
created. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd love for you to open it up with me to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to be in verse 14. It says, And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, lyre, harp, pipe, or all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue from my hands. That last sentence, King Nebuchadnezzar is really underestimating the power of their God. And their God's our God. And these three men, they could easily just say, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar, I'll bow down to this image that you've created so I won't get thrown into a furnace. Or they could say, no, I refuse because I'm believing that God's going to bring me out and he's going to deliver me whatever I'm facing. And same with us. We could easily go through this world thinking, I'll just take the easy way out. I'll just save a little bit more money. My finances will be okay. Or I'll say the right things to people so that they're pleased and nobody's feelings are hurt. And I'll just go with the flow. But we can't do that. We need to trust in God that he has a better plan for us. That what's in store for us is better than anything that we're facing right now. And I'm believing that you're not in this season by accident. God has you here for a reason and in this circumstance for a reason. Proverbs 17.3 says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. God wants to know who we're turning to in these times, in these fires that we're facing. Who are we turning to? Who are we looking to for guidance and seeking? How are you responding to what God already knows you're going through? He knows what you're walking through. He already knew you were going to walk through it. He's just waiting for you to turn and look to him and say, okay, God, take it. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. The process may be painful, but the outcome is powerful. I'm going to repeat it. The process may be painful, but the outcome is powerful. God's using this process that you're going through right now to grow you. He's going to use whatever circumstance you're faced with to bring you out and show you what God he is and what he's able to do. And in this process that you're going through, it could be impacting the person sitting next to you because they're watching how you respond. They're watching. They want to see the God that you serve. Genesis 50, 20 says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Guys, what the enemy intends for evil that we think is terrible, God's going to use it for good. And God's going to use it to glorify him. He's going to bring it out and he's going to show you that he is glorious and he's victorious. And in this story, these three men, they still refuse to bow down to this image. So they were tossed into this fire. And let's see what verse 24 says. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in that fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God's. Guys, God's in this fire with us ju right now, just like he was with them. He's walking through this time with you. He's not just a sideline guy. He's not hanging out on the side just watching you burn and stress out and have anxiety. He's running this race with you. He's standing right beside you, and he's in the game. He's there for you. And thankfully, these fires that we are facing, they're not wasted. Because in verse 28, we see, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except for their own god. These three men stood up for what they believed in, and they proved that their god was greater than anything that they're facing. And we have that same ability. We can show this world that what we're facing right now is just temporary. God has bigger things in store for us, and he's going to bring us through it. And guys, how we're responding to what we're facing right now could impact someone else's eternity. People are watching, like I said, they're watching you. They're saying, oh, she's a Christian. Why is she responding that way? Why do they say that? Why are they saying that to that person? What you say and how you respond could impact someone else's eternity. Amen. Amen. That's good stuff. I have to follow that, man. I'm telling you. Well, my name is Noah. I have the privilege and the honor of being able to serve here at Propel as the worship director. I have a, an amazing team. 
And so uh, just to jump right in, I'm going to be talking about the statement that God is not done. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, God is not done. All right, now I want you to turn to the other person and say, sorry, you weren't my first choice. We're going to make some friends this morning, y'all. We're going to make some friends. All right, so God is not done. So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn it there. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me. Just to give you a little bit of backstory of what we're going to be reading, we're going to be looking at the story of a man named Paul. Now, Paul is this preacher of the gospel. He travels from city to city spreading the message of Jesus, and he builds churches. And uh, in this, currently, he has actually been captured and is in prison because of going and sharing the gospel. And you read, starting in verse 3, it says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And so for Paul, it's crazy when you look at his story, whenever you backtrack a little bit and you look into how he got to where he is. He's actually like not this on fire dude that's just constantly preaching the gospel for all of his life. He actually was the exact opposite. He was this guy that his whole job was to kill Christians. He was a hitman against people of the faith. And so what happened in Paul's life to where he had this dramatic 180 in his life? So I just want to talk a little bit about that. My first point for you is that when God is in your life, everything changes. Everything changes. And for Paul, it's funny. It's like it's not just a lifestyle change for him. Like his name wasn't even Saul or wasn't even Paul before he encountered Jesus. It was Saul. So like God changed his life so much, he changed the first letter in his name. So he went from like super bad Saul to pretty cool Paul. It's just like this huge, dramatic change. And so it's very, it's very interesting to see that in his life. And so he went through all of this and he was, he was on a journey to a city called Damascus. And he ended up encountering Jesus and had this life-changing and impactful moment with Jesus to which it just changed his life forever. And for me, when I read that and whenever I dive into that story, I think to myself, how would I have felt if I would have been Paul? Like you imagine like you're murdering Christians as your job and now God wants to use you as your spokesman. I would honestly, I would feel unworthy. I'd feel like, man, I, I've got no place. Like God, I'm not the person. But yet God had something planned for him even whenever he didn't understand it, even whenever he didn't know it, that God had grace for him and God had something plan for him in a mighty and a powerful way. And so he stepped into it and he didn't look back and he didn't allow the past that he had to get into his head. I would say it like this, that your past doesn't prohibit the future that God has for you. So whatever you're going through this morning, whatever mistakes that you've made in your past, whatever, uh, whatever situations you've been placed in, that doesn't dictate the future that God has for you. It's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. And so whenever, you, whenever you're seeking after God with all of your heart, don't allow that past to get in the way of what God has for your future. And so for Paul, you look now, fast forward, and you look in this passage of Scripture again, and he is in prison for the things that he did. And so rather than complaining, rather than saying, oh, God, why am I, why am I here? Because I've sought after you. I've, I've, I've proclaimed your name. I've done all these great things in your name. Why am I in prison? Yet he doesn't question that. He, he encourages this church in a city called Philippi, and he says, hey, I want you to choose joy. I want you to know that God is working out all things, and God is doing a big work, and whether we can see it or not, whether we believe it or not, God is doing something incredible. And so whatever you're going through, imagine just for a moment if we would choose joy in the midst of our uncertainty, in the midst of our, of our concern or anxiety. Imagine how the atmosphere of our lives would shift if we would just choose joy and know that God is doing something special. God is doing something amazing because I don't care your financial status. I don't care the test results you got back from your doctor. I don't care about whatever circumstances that you may currently face, the depression that you have in your head, whatever is going on, that God is your strength. God is your healer. God is your, come on, 9 a.m. was half the people and got more excited than this. Y'all got to proclaim that, that God is doing a work in the midst of your uncertainty. Something so special. My, my second point, my last point for you is that your current situation can't rob your source of strength. Your current situation can't rob where you find strength and where you find hope in. For Paul, he's in prison, yet he knows that his strength is in Jesus. That the chains that he has, if he's in chains or if he's out of chains, he knows that God is good and God's already won the victory and that he's doing a work in his life. And for you and I, no matter what chains we're carrying, 
God is our source of strength. God's going to provide. And if we would just trust in that, if we would depend on him and lean on him and allow him to do the work that he wants to do, imagine how our outlook on life would change. So whatever you're going through, getting ready to close, I just want to say that God is your healer. God is your provider. God is your source of strength. God is your light. God is your victory. And so this morning, like, what I, want us, I want us to understand and come together and say that God is not done with you yet. Turn to your neighbor say, God's not done with you yet. With all your heart, proclaim it. God is not done with you yet. And I'm telling you from personal experience, from my, from my hardest of moments to my greatest of victories, God has been right in the dead center of it. And he's only just begun. So let's kick off 2020 saying that God is not done with me yet. God is not done with you yet. And I promise you that he is faithful to complete the work that he started in you. So good, so good. Well, my name is Tori. I am privileged and honored to serve here uh, on staff as our operations and experience director. And I'm just so pumped about this morning. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm going to say that one more time. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, maybe you've been hanging out with us for a couple of months now. You've heard, probably heard Pastor Nick say that phrase once or twice. Or maybe you've never heard that phrase in your entire life, and this is the very first time you're hearing it. I think it poses two questions. Where did that come from, and what does it mean? So I'm going to answer those today. I'm going to start with that first one. Where did it come from? In 1 Samuel chapter 15, God instructs Saul, who's the king of Israel, to go and totally destroy the Amalekites. Everything that breathes is to be destroyed. And so Saul sets out to do what God has asked him to do. And Samuel, who's the priest at the time, kind of feels and senses like Saul didn't exactly follow all of God's instructions. He gets to the camp. Um, and it's a really funny encounter because Saul's like, what do you mean? I did what God said. And Samuel says, um, I hear sheep and cows. And so, so as it turns out, Saul kept not just some animals alive, but also the king of the Amalekites. Now, if I'm sent to destroy an entire army, I'm 100% taken out their leader, but Saul does not. And he goes back and forth and and finally just offers up this excuse like, oh no, the animals, I saved them so that we could sacrifice them to God. He's, he's making an excuse and justifying his disobedience by saying, oh no, no, like here's what I was planning on doing with this. This is why I didn't listen to God. I was going to use this for God. And that's not at all what, what was asked of him. And then we get to verse 22 and, and Samuel says this in response. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So before I talk about how to live life within that obedience over sacrifice I want to tell you what the difference is. I think the biggest difference between obedience and sacrifice is attitude. The biggest difference between obedience and sacrifice is attitude. And Saul's arrogance cost him God's blessing. His focus in the moment was short term and it cost him God's blessing in the long term. But I don't think attitude matters just right there in the moment. I think it's the attitude that you carry with you as you continue to obey. When I was 17, I was presented with an incredible opportunity to join an organization called Youth with a Mission. And I was so excited. God stirred in my heart that this is what I was going to do. I was going to know God and make him known. But it meant that I was going to have to give up a couple of things. But I was so gung-ho on following him and obeying him that I didn't care that I was going to miss senior year. I didn't care that I was going to miss prom or graduation or senior thesis. And I'm still glad that I missed that. But, <laughs> but I, I didn't care about any of the stuff I was going to have to give up. I was so excited about following God until things didn't go my way. And a couple years ago, when Pastor Nick and I first started trying to get pregnant, things weren't going our way, and it was a little more difficult and complicated than we thought. 
and, it, it, and God was saying, not now. And I prayed this prayer. I said, God, don't you know what I've sacrificed for you? I was so caught up in what I'd done that I forgot about the most important part. And it's this, God cares more about your heart than your hustle. You can hustle all day long. God wants your heart, not your hustle. He's not ask, asking you to justify why you're not obeying him. He's just asking you to obey him. And so in verse 24 and 25, we see Samuel try and give another excuse. He has a little change of heart. He says, um, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. The second point I have for you today is that the fear of man will cause you to lose sight of what God is asking you to do. Saul was so caught up in what his soldiers might think of him that he allowed them to, to lead the people into disobedience. And look, as their leader, he, they, as their leader, he was responsible for them. And what you don't correct, you condone. But how often do we do that? We're so afraid of what people are going to say about us or think about us that we, we totally turn and lose sight of what God's asking us to do. So what does it look like to live in obedience? It looks like this. Obedience is knowing you will have to make sacrifices, but trusting that what God has in store is so much better. So much better. You're going to have to give up some things, but if God's asking you to give them up, it means that he's got something better in store for you in the future. So today, my challenge, as we go into 2020, step into what God is calling you to do and just obey him. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Good, good. Can we just give it up for these beautiful people behind me? My toe's been getting stepped on all morning, and uh, anytime I have the privilege and honor of getting this mic, I like to honor Pastor Nick and Tori, so if you'll just give it up for Pastor Nick and Tori, we, we love you, this church loves y'all, thank you so much for what you do. So this morning I want to talk about um, where do I run, where do I run, this is, this is going to be a little bit of a testimony, I know some of y'all are kind of looking at me like, uh, brother, I ain't running nowhere unless somebody's chasing me. And I get it. The good news for you is that this is more of just a metaphor about making hard decisions. Although, ironically, you're going to hear me talk about taking a little bit of a run. So before I jump into the message, I just need to tell you a little backstory about myself. About two years ago, I felt God call me into the fire service. So I went to volunteer, and I went on this really long journey of collecting all these certifications and getting to a place where I was able to do my job as a professional, and it was really difficult because I was having to work full-time, still be a husband and a father, and raising kids. How many people got kids, man? Raising kids is hard, right? So I'm trying to juggle all these things uh, as, as well as serving here at the church and motion students. Where are my motion students at? All right, cool, guys. Thanks. I love you, too. Right? <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so, so I'm juggling all these things in my life, and I'm also trying to obtain these certifications, and it was really hard. So in May, I finally got all my certifications. I was able to jump to being a full-time firefighter. And I had one of those moments where I looked in the mirror and I was like, bro, you made it. Thank you, God, so much. You have brought me to this place. I am here. I have arrived. I was comfortable. I loved the company I was on. I loved the people that I got to work with, the town that I was in. And I also enjoyed um, the leadership that I had at that current fire department. So we're just going to refer to that as Fire Department A. Now, as many of you might know, as a firefighter, uh, a lot of us have to work part-time jobs and able to, in order to make ends meet. So Fire Department B is my part-time place, and I'm at Department B, and they have this opportunity for me to be full-time. And it really floored me because I was comfortable. Everybody say comfortable with me. All right, come on, 1030. Y'all can do better than that. Let's say comfortable. So I really felt comfortable at Department A, but I really realized there was a big opportunity at Department B. So I had to make a decision. So the first thing I have for you this morning is to write this down, please. Intentionally seek out God. We need to intentionally seek out God whenever we have difficult decisions to make. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm left on my own to make decisions, I usually do something stupid. So I need God, a great, big, powerful God, to help me make good decisions. So ironically, or not really any irony to it, but it just so happened 
that my family and I were going to Carolina Beach for a vacation. So I'm on my way down to the beach, and I'm thinking about this decision, this big decision I have to make. Do I go with A? Do I go with B? And I'm asking God to just speak into my life. So we get to the beach, and I decide that I'm going to go for a 5K run. And that sounds crazy, and I don't normally do that, but I decide I'm going to run a 5K. So I get up the next morning, and I open up Scripture, and the first thing God shows me is this Scripture in Hebrews 11.6. He says, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So I put on my, my iPhone, I got my armband, and I got to put my headphones in so I don't have to listen to me breathe out of breath. And I start on my journey down the beach, and as I start down the beach, I hit play on this little app I got on my, on my phone tells me exactly how many miles I've run. So at every mile, she's going to tell me you're at one mile, eight minutes, however many, that's, that's a long time, but it's going to tell me my time intervals. So I get running down the beach, and God is showing me this beautiful sunrise, and I see these pelicans are flying around, and he's reminding me of all these scriptures. My brain is just being flooded with his love and his vastness, and my heart is being filled, and I'm thinking about how even the wind and the waves will obey him. And I'm thinking about just how big my God is. He's showing me how vast his love is for me. I see these pelicans, and they're floating, and they're swooping around, and he's providing fish for them, and he reminds me of scripture that says that he will give us wings to soar like eagles. And in a moment he reminded me that in that scripture he gave it to a prophet in the Old Testament and that he was facing trial and tribulation during it. So if y'all are tracking the direction that God is taking me already, I'm kind of figuring out that this might be a difficult transition for me. So as I continue on down this beach, I get to what I'm going to call the point or the turning point. And at this turning point, I cannot go this direction any further. I have to turn around. So it's a good time for me to look at my armband and see just how far I've run. Thank the Lord, I'm about 1.5 miles. That means that I'm about halfway there because a 5K is three miles. So I'm at the turning point. I make the turn. I start heading back down the beach. And in my mind, I'm like, if I was at 1.5, 1.5 plus 1.5 is three. That means I should finish where I started. So here I am running down the beach, and I'm out of breath. And I'm like, God, please just make this end. I can see the finish line. I can see where I'm starting. So I run right past where I started. And my stupid phone won't tell me that I'm at three miles yet, right? I'm like, come on, phone, tell me I'm at three miles. And as I'm in this moment and I'm out of breath and I'm working hard, God speaks into my life and he says, do you have the faith to follow me even when you can't see the finish line? Do you have the faith to follow me even when you can't see the finish line? So I went back to the house and I reflected on everything God had showed me that day. And the biggest point I took away from it is that faith is not an emotion. And I think that you and I, we get to make small choices sometimes that have a big impact. And then there's these moments in our life where we make these big choices and they have a big impact. And if we're intentional about inviting God into it, we need to put our feelings aside. Because comfort will keep us from growth every single time. God showed me in that day that he wanted me to go in a direction that I knew was going to have trials and tribulations. I knew that I was going to have to go back through some things that were going to be difficult for me. And I knew that the choice wasn't easy. So as God carried me through this season, he has exceeded every expectation that I could possibly have for my life. And it wasn't easy, and I couldn't do it on my own. He's surrounded me with the right people. He's provided the right opportunities at the right time. He's been there through everything with me. And he showed me that faith is not an emotion. So maybe this morning you're in here and you're saying to yourself that you've got a big decision to make. Right, we're at the end of 2019, 2020, come on, you've been on IG like, hey, new year, new me, I see you. And maybe you've done this every single year, 2017, 2018, 2019, and nothing has changed. So maybe this year, maybe this morning, you're ready to see something different happen. So church, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, I'd like to invite those people, if that's you this morning, I'd like to invite you to just boldly raise your hand, to just boldly put your hand up in the air to accept the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Scripture says that when Jesus came, the veil was torn and split wide open. That means that the sin that separates you and I from God can no longer separate us with the acceptance of Jesus Christ. And church, we don't, we don't, we don't pray alone this morning. So if that's you, if that's you, just boldly raise your hand up in the air right now for me. I see those. I see those hands all across this room, church. So church, let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, Today I give you my life. Thank you for dying in my place. 
so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen.